Good morning. It's Good Friday, 9 a.m. It's a good day to talk to you about this subject. This is day five of the Locke and Lewis lecture series. I hope you've been following us throughout the week with seven lectures prior to this one. And this one is a very important one, very significant in the church calendar, in the, in the history of the church. Um, all churches, or most, have been commemorating the death of Jesus on this day. And so this is Holy Week, or Passion Week, as I've said a number of times. And I'm Scott Cherry, the host of this lecture series. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the pastor of the church that I attend. This is Pastor Jeff Davis. He's going to be talking to you this morning about the mystery of the cross, God's eternal plan, which was totally unexpected by man. We're going to take two days off, tomorrow and Sunday, but on Monday we're going to pick up with the final lecture will be presented by myself, and that one will be focused on the resurrection. But for now, let me invite Jeff Davis to come and to address you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Scott. Good morning. How are you? It's good to be here. And I know that for many of you, this is the first time you've seen me on television. Oh, wait a minute. This is the first time I have been on television. So it's the first time for everyone. But this is exciting, or at least on the Internet. And yes, as, as Scott said, we're going to talk about God's eternal plan, something that he's planned from eternity. He told about it throughout all the scriptures, and yet many people were um, totally surprised by it. How can this be? How can it be that what God had planned and told through the prophets was still unexpected by uh, even his uh, closest disciples. That's what we want to look at. And um, <clears throat> there's many places to start when we think of the life of Jesus. And uh, um, one of the, an important part of the story of Jesus is John the Baptist. And so we want to start <coughs> with uh, John's story. And uh, he is, uh, without him, the message of of Jesus would be incomplete. He was prophesied by Isaiah 700 years before Christ and also by Malachi 400 years before Christ that God would send a messenger, a prophet, who would prepare the way for the Lord to come. And, uh, and that's what he did. And, and uh, Isaiah said he would be a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. And this meant um, of course, he's using an, an analogy of preparing a road, the king's highway, for the king to come visit a city or an or, or a, a, a area. And they would, make, they would uh, fill in the low spots and they would raise, raise them up. And if the spots were too high in the road, they would lower them. If it was crooked, they'd make it straight. And they would make this beautiful highway uh, for the king to come into their village. And they wanted it to look really good. But he was using that as an analogy for us how we need to make our hearts right for God to come into our hearts. And, and what's the problem with our hearts? Well, many of them are crooked, like these roads. And so John came calling people to repentance. He called them to uh, confess their sins and say, I'm not ready for the Lord to come. If the Lord comes now, I'm not ready. I need to repent. And he said, um, you need to be baptized. And so he baptized them in the water, which is a very interesting symbol. That the Jews at that time were baptizing Gentiles. And it was a symbol of new birth, death to the old life, and, and coming into a new birth. It's just as when a woman gives birth, the baby is in a, in a bag of water. The baby is born of water. And so they were saying, you need a new birth. You Gentiles were born badly. You, were, you weren't born to uh, Judah to the, our, our nation, you were born and in, 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 to the Gentiles. You need to be born again. And so they would baptize them. And John came baptizing the Jews. He said, don't think that because Abraham is your father that this is enough for you. No, it's not enough for you. And so he said, I'll baptize you f uh, for repentance, but I'm just using water. One comes after me, far greater than I am. One's coming after me, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will give you new birth. I can't do that. I'm just giving you a symbol of that, baptizing you in water. 
but you are in faith repenting and saying, I need what this one coming after you will bring. And, and that would be the Lord. And so he was preparing people for Jesus. And, it's, and um, the scriptures say in Luke chapter 7 that um, the ones, the people who listened to John also listened to Jesus. And the ones who didn't listen to John didn't listen to Jesus. The ones who refused John also refused Jesus. And think about that. We see a picture here of these people coming out to be baptized. And, and, and these people are coming in the water. They're confessing their sins. And they say, Lord, I know you're holy and I'm not. I'm not ready to be part of your kingdom. Please forgive my sins and, 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 uh, and give me new life. When, when the Messiah comes, he'll give me that life. And the, there's people on the sides going... Now, that guy should go. Yeah, he's a sinner. Oh, yeah, and she's definitely a sinner, too. It's good that they go. And yet there are people on the, on, standing on the side. They don't get into the water. They don't confess their sins. And they don't repent. And these are the same people. When Jesus came, they gave Jesus a hard time, and they, they wouldn't listen to him. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, we think of John... He, he called people to repent. But as you remember, John was put in prison by King Herod. He'd, he'd called Herod out on a sin. Herod had taken his brother's wife and was, uh, um, had, had married his brother's wife, which is not allowed. Uh, it, and, and John called him on this sin of adultery. And, and so King Herod put him in prison. And as we know, John was actually killed later. He was martyred. But while he's in prison, he, brought, he had two of his disciples come, and he sent these two disciples to Jesus. Because Jesus' ministry is getting bigger and bigger. He's healing people. He's going around preaching. And everyone's saying, could this be the Christ, the promised one? Is this the one that, that all the prophets have talked about? And many people are putting their faith in Christ. And here's John languishing in a prison. And he sends two disciples, and he, and he says, ask him this. Are you the one who is to come? Or are we to expect another? Are you the promised one, promised in, in all the prophets? Or is there going to be another? And because in the Old Testament, some of the promises and the prophecies were about this conquering king who would set their people free and, and, and bring justice and, and punish injustice and punish the people who were against the people of God. But also, there's, especially in Isaiah 53, there's this suffering servant who comes like a lamb to the slaughter, and he takes away the sin of many. And so he's, is he a suffering servant, or is he a conquering king? And some of the, the rabbis would argue and say, maybe there's two messiahs. Well, there's not two messiahs, and we'll see uh, a little bit later what the answer to that is. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect another? Some people say John didn't doubt because he knew right from the beginning that the because he introduced Jesus this way. He said, "Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." This is in the Gospel of John, chapter one, verse twenty-nine. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus came to be a sacrificial lamb. He came on Passover to be that lamb. Later, the Apostle Paul tells us in First Corinthians. Uh, chapter 5, that he, that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So therefore, let us keep the festival of unleavened bread without the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with uh, bread without leaven or yeast, the uh, bread of sincerity and truth. And so, yes, Jesus came on, on Passover to be the fulfillment of all the prophecies uh, regarding him through all the prophets. Now, Jesus told uh, the disciples, um, go back and tell John what you've seen. Some people think that John wasn't doubting, but his, he wanted the faith of his disciples built up after he would die, that uh, they, would, they would know that all of this is in God's plan. But it's possible that John was doubting because it's one thing to believe and it's another thing to believe when you're under extreme pressure. But he did the right thing. He went and got word from Christ, who is the word of God. If you have doubts, we need to go to the word of God. And he, so he sent these people, and they asked Jesus the question, and Jesus gave him this answer. Go back and tell John what you've seen. You see the lame walking. You see the blind 
with their sight, the deaf now hear, even the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel, the good news, preached to them. Go back and tell them this. Now, these aren't just random miracles. They are miracles, and, and they're very powerful, and people were amazed, and they were miracles that helped people. <laughs> they weren't like what magicians do or something like that to show off some kind of, uh, and, and just mystify people. No, these were actually miracles that help people. But these were actually prophesied by the prophets. This is what the Messiah would do. And, and so these very things, Jesus came doing these things as it was told in the Old Testament. So fulfilled prophecy is a proof of who Christ is. He said, go back and tell John those things. And so they leave. And then the Lord Jesus talks to the crowd of people who are around him. And he said, you went out to the desert to see John. Why did you go out there? Did you go out to see a reed blown in the wind? Is it you went out to see nature and its purest, no people, just pristine um, uh, setting? Did you go out to look at nature, the flora and the fauna? No. Did you go see, out to see a rich man finely dressed and, 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 and beautiful clothes? He said, you can't find those kind of people in the desert. They're in the palace or, you know, they're, they're big businessmen or they're political leaders or, uh, or celebrities. No, you didn't go to see that. What did you go out to see? A prophet. You went out to see the prophet. You went into the desert to see a prophet, and you did. But he's more than a prophet. He said of John, of all the people born of, of woman, John is the greatest. But even the, the least who's in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Now, what did he mean by that? John, who was John? John was the last Old Covenant prophet. He was the seal of the Old Covenant. Now, his story is told in the New Testament, but he's an Old Covenant prophet, prophesied by Malachi, the, the last written book in the Old Testament. And he puts an end to the Old Covenant because Jesus comes in and he brings in the New Covenant. He fulfills the Old Covenant. And so everyone now in the New Covenant is in a greater position than even John was. Now, think of <coughs> all the prophets. Here, here's a Bible. I often show people this. And I say, so God uh, sent a prophet, and he would minister so many years, and then his, his ministry would be summed up in, in, in what's written down here, and then he'd send another prophet, and we'd get more, more um, scriptures, and another prophet, another prophet, and we have a history of the prophets here in, in, this, in this book. And, and God would say, or the prophets would say, um, trust, trust God. God will, will, uh, will make everything right. He'll fix the sin problem. He'll fix us. He'll, he'll fix the injustice problem. He'll finally bring justice. He'll bring um, righteousness to the earth. And he will receive us back to himself. So wait for God's salvation. Wait for the one that God will send. And so all the prophets were saying, trust God, hope in his promises, wait for his Savior. Trust God, hope and wait, hope and wait. All of them said that except John. John said, stop waiting. Stop waiting. He's here. Is it you, John? No, it's not me. It's not me. He's here. He who comes after me, he's so far greater than I am. And John sums up all the prophets. He's, he's far greater than all the line of the prophets. Sometimes I hear uh, from my Muslim friends that Jesus was another prophet. No. John very clearly says, no, he's the one all the prophets talked about. He's the one that um, is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to um, abolish the law or nullify the law or put an end to the law. No, I've come to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment of the promises of God. And so he is all that we are waiting for. John got to say, stop waiting He's here. And then he, introduced, he baptizes Jesus so that Jesus is identified with us sinners. He's connected to us, even though he's without sin. John said, I shouldn't baptize you. I need you to baptize me with the Spirit. And he said, no, John, we need to do this for, to fulfill all righteousness. So John baptized him. This, the, the Spirit came as a dove, symbolizing the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And uh, that started the three and a half years of ministry, ending uh, at the cross in the empty tomb. But Jesus, all of these things being prophesied in the Old Testament still took people by surprise. 
because they expected of Jesus to be that conquering king who would set them free from the oppression of the evil Roman Empire and even their own evil um, uh, rulers. King Herod was not even was not a descendant of David. He was not rightfully, uh, he didn't belong to the throne. In fact, he wasn't even Jewish by birth. He was from the line of Edom or Esau and not a Jewish king. But the, th but the thing is that Jesus came differently than what they expected and uh, there's a reason for that. But here's something that they criticized. Um, they criticized John for and they criticized Jesus for. So in the, in the same passage where Jesus is eulogizing John and he says he's more than a prophet, he's this great man, and the people rejoice because the people that had believed John, were baptized by John, were so happy to hear Jesus speak highly of John. And they're the same ones who follow Jesus. But he says, listen what people say. They say, John, why, John was so strange. He was so weird. He, he didn't eat and he didn't drink. John didn't have normal food. He didn't have normal clothing. He clothed himself with uh, sackcloth. This means these burlap bags that they used to carry uh, stuff in on the backs of donkeys. It's real, it's only the poorest of poor would wear something like that. And that's what John would wear. And he had a, a leather belt. And he ate wild honey and locust. Locust, uh, these insects, were actually part of the clean uh, foods that they were allowed in the Levitical laws back in the Old Testament. And, and so John, he didn't care about his clothing. He didn't care about his food. And they said, John has a demon. He's crazy. Because he didn't eat and drink and dress like normal people. But the Lord Jesus comes along and he eats and drinks and dresses like normal people. And they say, look at this guy. All he does is eat and drink. He's a glutton. He's a, he's a drunkard. Isn't that funny? Isn't that strange? And they said, and he's a friend of sinners. And so they criticized the Lord Jesus for being a friend of sinners. It's not what people expected. They expected him to come and punish the sinners. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is a picture from... Um, the Jesus film, and the man standing there is Zacchaeus. And he's about to uh, give money away because he's so happy that, that Jesus has come into his house. So Jesus came um, as, a, as a friend of sinners and, and eating and drinking with people and embracing them and, sh and saying the kingdom of God is open to sinners. Now, um, yeah, well, here it is, the passage. For John neither came eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, isn't that strange? Look at that. They criticize one man for not eating and drinking, and then they criticize the other man for eating and drinking. How can you possibly do that? People do this all the time. It's called double standards. And double standards are, are the bane of society. How can we learn anything about ourselves and, and learn whether or not we're sinners who need to repent if we have double standards? One standard for us and another standard for other people. And so we're judging people and saying they're wrong, they're sinners, they need to repent, God's going to judge them, they're under the curse of God, and yet we do the same thing. How can, how can we uh, judge them and we're doing the same thing? It's because we have double standards. And, and Jesus said, you know, you need to judge yourself with the same standard that you judge other people. And you need to measure yourself with the same measure that you measure other people. And in fact, this is right out of Deuteronomy 25. He says uh, in, in Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 16, don't have differing weights in your bag, one heavy and one light. Don't have two different measures in your house, one large and one small. You must have accurate and honest me weights and measures so that you will live long in the land that the Lord God has given you. And the Lord detests anyone who deals dishonestly. And, and, and uh, this, what this is, there would be a double pan balance. And whatever you're measuring, it could be food, it could be grain, it could be um, gold, whatever it is. They put in one pan whatever you're buying and in his other pan a weight. And so these people would have two sets of weights. When they're buying, the weights would be heavy. So instead of getting 16 ounces to the pound, they'd get 18 ounces to the pound or something like that. But when they sold, their weight would be light. They're selling it now, and instead of selling 16 ounces of the pound, they would sell uh, 14 ounces of the pound. Oh, and if they'd have um, a bushel basket, 
when they're buying, the bushel basket is bigger. When they're selling, the bushel basket is smaller. And people think, oh, I'm so smart. People have double standards all the time, and it prevents us from being able to see reality and to be able to see ourselves. So it's a, it mocks justice. It excuses ourselves while we condemn others. And it makes learning impossible. It breaks the golden rule. It's self-contradictory, so therefore it ruins logic. And it hinders humility. And what we, we need humility so that we might uh, understand that we're sinners and that we could repent. Well, so here they are judging Jesus. And why are they doing that? Because they don't want to repent. They don't want to hear what John's message was. And if we can't hear John's message that we're sinners in need of repentance, we won't listen to Jesus when he comes um, to uh, be the Savior from sin. They were surprised when Jesus came riding on a donkey, fulfilling the, the prophecy of, of Zechariah in, 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 in Psalm 118. He came as the Davidic uh, king, the son of David. They were, they were crying out to him, Hail the son of David! Hail the, 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 the king, the Messiah! And so he comes in, and, and we celebrated that, we remember that uh, last uh, Sunday. Uh, we call it Palm Sunday when they laid down palm leaves, like laying out the red carpet for him. Some put their coats on the, on the ground. Some put the coats on the, on the, the, the donkey. And so they're, they're worshiping and they're celebrating and they're, and they're thinking, here comes our king. This, God is finally bringing his kingdom now. Now we're going to be set free. Everything's going to be right. And people were, were, were very happy and celebrating. But the religious rulers were saying, listen to these people. You need to tell them to stop. And he said, no, I can't tell them to stop. If they stop, the stones will cry out because Jesus was the rightful king and he was coming into his city, the city of David. But there's something they didn't understand about that. And then the next thing is, after celebration comes confrontation and Jesus runs out the people out of the temple area. The outer court was the court of the Gentiles. It's where the nations were, come to, were, were to come and pray. It was, uh, God said, my house is to be a house of prayer for all the nations. But instead, that courtyard was taken up with little booths where, where people were buying and s uh, selling stuff and they were uh, trading um, coins. They didn't allow them to have uh, the Roman coin because it had the picture of the emperor on it and the emperor called himself God. And, and so they said, no, you have to trade in your Roman coins for Jewish coins, which only had pictures of, of um, animals and, um, and uh, trees and stuff like that. But they, in, in doing this, since they controlled the trade rate, they, they, they um, made the trade rate uh, wrong, and they, they actually cheated the people. Also... Uh, Moses allowed them to bring an animal, and on Passover they would bring an animal, a, a lamb, one-year-old lamb or goat, and they would sacrifice it. But the priest would look at it. It had to be healthy, and the priest could say, oh, it's not healthy enough. But you can sell it to this man over here and buy a healthy one from him. And so they would go over there, and they'd, they'd trade in the animal that they brought. It seemed perfectly healthy, and they'd get a new one, uh, and they have to pay some extra money there. And then probably the next day, they, they, that same animal that wasn't healthy the day before is healthy enough to be sold. And so they were, they were ripping people off in the temple and preventing the Gentiles from worshiping. And Jesus said, this is not to happen. And he ran the people out of there. And this is um, something that happens all around the world. Wherever there's a religious place and people make pilgrimages to that place, and, and they can, whatever religion it is, the people can, the, the pilgrims come, they, they're full of faith, they believe what they're doing, but the people living there can get used to making money off religion. And, and they see some of the corruption, they get involved in some of the corruption, um, and uh, it eats away at their own faith, and pretty soon they're very cynical, and um, they don't believe. Now, of course, in this series, one of the things that Scott and the other people are doing, they're, they're doing apologetics, and they're saying, um, how do we know if something's true or false? How, do, how, can, we, how can we tell that? It, just because someone believes something sincerely doesn't make it true. And if someone doubts something uh, with a full conviction, it doesn't make it untrue. We need to find out what's true, what's real, and believe that. And there are evidences for, for Christianity, and that's part of what this series does, is give evidences for Christianity. 
And so here he is. Um, he's kicking people out of the, the, the temple because the very purpose is that it would be a house of prayer for all nations and, and not a den of thieves. Now, um, the next thing we see is uh, what was so startling to his own disciples. There's a fig tree. It's in leaf. There's no figs, and Jesus curses the tree, and the tree withers up. Well, that's a strange thing to do. It's an act of power, and Jesus said, yes, it's, uh, you can have the same power when you pray. Uh, God will answer prayer, but it becomes a symbol, and the symbol is that the nation led by these um, corrupt rulers should bring forth good fruit, but they're not bringing forth good fruit, and so they, it was a warning. They need to repent or they'll come under a curse. And so it was an object lesson to say that um, there's, a, there's a, about to be a curse coming upon these, uh, these leaders. Now, some people think that uh, the same people on Palm Sunday who celebrated Jesus on, on good, uh, good Friday, or Sad Friday it's called in some places, said crucify Jesus, crucify him. It's not the same people. Why was the, the arrest at night and why was the trial early hours? They did it before the pilgrims woke up, the people who had come from all over to, to, to celebrate the Passover. And these people had heard Jesus and were, were believing Jesus. And these are the same people that Jesus is meeting in the temple every day during Holy Week and preaching, and they're hearing him, some of them for the first time, hearing Jesus. And so as the pilgrims... Uh, by the time they got up, Jesus was already on the cross. The people that were used to um, making money off their religion, because every year during, there was three times when there would be pilgrimages to, to Jerusalem, they could rent a room in their house, or they could make bread and sell it, or they could just do something to um, make money that, to meet needs of the pilgrims. These people were ones that the high, the, the high priest would call and say, we need a crowd. Come here and stand before Pilate and say the things that we need. So he was easy for them to find a crowd of people who were cynical in their faith. But it wasn't the same people who, who uh, said, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, here comes the Messiah. It wasn't the same people. His disciples d didn't turn against him. His, the apostles didn't turn against him. Now, it's true that Peter became full of fear and he denied him, but he didn't turn against him and say, crucify him. No, th that's, not th that's not the same case. We have to be careful that we don't let our hearts be hardened towards truth. Well, <clears throat> so they said, how can you do this? How can you throw people out of the temple? Who, what right do you have to do this? By what authority do you do this? And so they challenged Jesus' authority. And Jesus, uh, and Jesus said, okay. You want to know what authority I have? I'll tell you where my authority comes from, but first I'm going to ask you a question. When you answer my question, I'll answer your question, and I'll tell you where my authority comes from. He said, John, his baptism, was that from man or was that from God? John calling people to repentance. John baptizing them and saying that one coming after him would bring um, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Was John's ministry of God or not? Well, th this took them by surprise. And so they huddled together and they said, what are we going to say? They didn't say, what's the truth? What's real? They said, what can we say? If we say this, what will happen? If we say that, what will happen? They didn't care about truth. They cared about just what was going to be the result. They only cared about consequences, not about truth. And that's very important. And so they said, well, if we say uh, John's baptism is from God, then he'll say, why didn't you listen to John? Why didn't you follow him? Why didn't you get baptized? Why didn't you repent of your sins? Why didn't you receive the one that he talked about? So we can't say that. But if we say it's not from God, it's from man, we're afraid of the people because all the people believe that he's a prophet sent from God. So we're in trouble either way. What should we say? We don't know. So they went back to Jesus. They said, we don't know. And he said, okay. Since you didn't tell me, I won't tell you either. But I will say this. There was a man. He had two sons. And the man had a vineyard. And he said, he went to the, one of the sons and he said, son, please go out and work in the vineyard today. Nope, not doing it, dad. I don't want to do that today. I got other things to do. Not doing it. And so he goes to the second son. He said, son, will you go out and work in the vineyard today? 
He said, sure, Dad, I'll do it. The second one said, I'll do it, but he didn't go. The first one said no, but then he changed his mind. So, uh, I was wrong. I shouldn't talk to my dad that way. He wants me to work. So he went and worked. At first he said no, but then he, and, and didn't do it, but then he changed his mind and did it. And then Jesus said, which of the sons did the will of the father? They said, well, the first one. They answered correctly, but they didn't understand the lesson. Who was the first son who at first didn't do it, then later changed his mind? What we call that when you change your mind and do what you didn't do the first time? It's called repentance. So who repented? The sinners and tax collectors that they were making fun of. The ones who listened to John, that's who repented. And so they repented, and he said, I tell you, the tax collectors and sinners are entering the kingdom of God before you. And so he gave them another warning. But they didn't give up. So Jesus is every day in the temple uh, during Holy Week. He's teaching the people right in front of the authorities, the religious authorities, and he's, he's actually taunting them. And they're, but they're afraid of the people. And, but they, they say, okay, we'll, get, we'll set a trap for Jesus. We'll set a trap for him. We'll ask him some questions, and that when he, either way he answers, he'll be in trouble. So the first one they said, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? We got him. We got him. We, this is good. If he says no, we'll go tell the governor, Pontius Pilate. This guy's saying don't pay taxes to Caesar. And if he says yes, we'll say to the people, look, he's supporting that evil Roman government, our oppressors. Do you want to follow someone like that? So we got him. And so they asked Jesus the question, and Jesus said, uh, what coin is it that you use to, to uh, pay the tax? Whose image is on it? And what's the inscription? And if you look here in the picture, you see this is a, a picture of Caesar Augustus. has his name written out. And, and he, he claimed himself to be divine. Uh, and they said, Caesar's, Caesar's. He said, okay. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Now, where do we see the image of God? Where's that? Where's that? In the beginning, God created man, male and female, in his image. So if you're going to give the image back to God, it means you give yourself back to God. Well, another group came along, the Sadducees, and the Sadducees only believed in the writings of Moses. They didn't believe in any of the later prophets. And in their reading of Moses, they said there's no resurrection. Um, actually, there's hints of the resurrection there. But they said, no, there's no resurrection. And they rejected the later prophets where the resurrection is more, is more um, obvious. And so they said, we have a situation. You know, in the law, uh, there's this law of the Leverite marriage where um, uh, uh, if there's a brother and he gets married but he dies before he has any children, his brother is to take his, the, the brother's wife, the, the brother's widow, and uh, marry her, and then the child born to her belongs to the brother and has his name and inherits the brother's property and name. And he said this, there were seven brothers, and the first one married this woman, and he died without children. So the second one married her, and he died without children. The third one, you know, so far, this could be Judah and his, and, uh, and, uh, his sons marrying Tamar. Um, but it says all seven of them married the woman. None of them have children. They all died. And then finally, the woman, the woman died herself. And in heaven, whose wife is she going to be? Gotcha. They thought they got him. And he said, you are in error. You don't know the power of God, and you don't know the scriptures. In the scriptures, God says to Moses at the bush, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of, Jake, of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. He doesn't say, I was Abraham's God, and I was uh, Isaac's God, and I was Jacob's God. He says, I am. They still exist, though not on the earth and not in this body. So you don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. In heaven, we won't be marrying. We'll be like the angels. And so people were afraid to ask him questions after that. 
something else that was surprising about Jesus is after some Greeks came to the temple, they heard Jesus was there, they, they said um, uh, to Andrew, we would like to see Jesus. Can we see him? Is that possible? So Andrew and Philip brought them to Jesus. And then when Jesus heard that, this was a signal of his, uh, of his work, that the nations he, he would come to him. It's too small a thing for him only to redeem Israel. He's going to redeem the whole world. And the Greeks, which is another way of saying all the nations, because Alexander the Great had conquered uh, the Mediterranean world and forced everyone to learn Greek. And so the Jews said, there's us and the Greeks, meaning everyone else. And so this was a symbol of the rest of the world. And Jesus said, this shows why I've come. He said, a, a grain of wheat... If it remains, it remains alone. But if it dies and is buried, it'll come up and bring many with it. And so Jesus is going to bring many with him, but to do that, he has to die and be buried. It, and he'll, he'll bring many with him. And then he said, <clears throat> My heart's troubled, but what shall I say? As he's looking forward to the cross, he's looking uh, to his death. He said, Shall I say, Father, save me from from this hour save me from the cross no it was for this very reason i came into the world i came to this hour father don't save me from the, from this don't save me from the cross but glorify your name and then a voice came out of heaven and said i have glorified it and i will glorify it again the crowd that heard that said uh, that was thunder and someone else said no it was an angel and isn't it interesting that people interpret data differently according to the, their, their understanding. And that was very surprising. And then, of course, we can think of the night before the arrest. Um, they're having their Passover meal. And uh, is, this is something that has been celebrated for 1,400 years before Christ came. This, this is a celebration of Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. How did they do that? It was because of the last plague, the tenth plague, which was the death of the firstborn. And God said, every home the firstborn son will die unless you kill a lamb and put its blood on the, the outside, the top and sides of the door. And then the angel of death will not enter that home where there's the blood. If the blood's not there, he'll enter the home and the, the firstborn will, be, will die, whether it's just a child or a grown man. Uh, they'll, they'll die. And so he said, remember that. Every year you're to um, take a lamb and kill it. They didn't put the blood again because it only happened once. But every year remember this. And they would eat the lamb and they'd have bitter herbs and they would celebrate this Passover. And they'd have a, a week of a festival called the week of unleavened bread. They wouldn't have any leaven in their house or any yeast in their house. And they did this. They were supposed to do this continually for 1,400 years. And... During this Passover, Jesus is the, becomes the Passover lamb, and he fulfills uh, what was uh, pointing to him. And so he said, um, I, have eagerly, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he gave them, uh, he took a bread, and he, he, he broke it. He said, this is my body. And then he took, uh, he said, all of you eat it. And then he took um, the, the cup and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Now all of those promises have, are coming to fulfillment in Christ. That's why we don't sacrifice lambs anymore. Our lamb has been sacrificed. The blood of animals can't take away sin. They were just pictures of what Christ came to do. He came to be that Passover lamb. And the disciples, they ate the bread and they, they drank the wine. They heard his words, but they didn't understand who he was talking about. It was too hard for them to understand. They thought he was going to bring the kingdom with power. They didn't understand he was going to be this sacrificial lamb. So and they're, they're sad from his words. They didn't understand really what he meant. They left from there. They went to the garden of Gethsemane. Um, in the um, Mountain of Olives. And uh, he took three of them with him, and he said, 
he left the main group, took the three a little farther, and he said, stay awake and pray with me. Uh, my, my soul is, is, is ready to break. I need your support. And then he went just slightly farther away, and he's praying in private. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup uh, be taken away from me. But there is no other way. He prayed it three times. And each time he prayed it, he came back, and he found them sleeping. They were so tired. And he said, why are you sleeping? You shouldn't be sleeping. You need to be praying. A great trial is coming upon us, and you need spiritual power for that trial. Don't be asleep. But they kept falling into sleep. They, they, they didn't have the strength it needs when the trial came. But then when the night was finally over and Jesus is arrested, uh, Jesus had the power. The, the night of prayer was more difficult for Jesus than the day of suffering. By the time that night was over, angels had come and, and supported him. He's ready. He's ready for the fight. And so he was arrested. His disciples were shocked by this. They all ran away. And uh, the chief priests didn't want blood in their hands and, um, because they could have said, Jesus is a blasphemer, let's stone him. But they didn't want blood in their hands. So they said, let's let the Romans do it. And then the people will blame the Romans. And so they went to Pilate and they said, this man, he deserves to die. And he said, this is all about your religious law. I don't care anything about religious law. You, you deal it with yourself. No, no, he has to die because he called himself a king. And that makes him in opposition to Caesar. And Caesar can't have any other kings. So you need to kill him because he's claiming to be a king. They're trying to say that Jesus was like an insurrectionist leading people in rebellion against against uh, Caesar. And it's interesting because they did have in prison at that time an insurrectionist who, who claimed to be uh, a messiah who would uh, lead people away using military might, uh, and that was Barabbas. And uh, with him, a couple of his, um, his uh, co-compatriots, um, and they were caught, and they were going to be executed. So they, they take him to Pilate. Pilate hears that they call him a king. And he says, are you a king? He said, my kingdom's not of this world. If my, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have fought to prevent my arrest. But my kingdom is not of this world. He said, you're right to call me a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and, and for this I came into the world, that I might testify to truth. So his is a different kind of kingdom. He's a different kind of king. His was a kingdom of truth. And of course, Pilate said, truth, what's that? Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate knew what the answer was. Pilate knew that this was an innocent man. Even his wife had said that she'd suffered badly in a dream. And they believed, uh, uh, highly believed in, in, in dreams and things like that. She said, this is an innocent man. Don't have anything to do with him. He's going to bring trouble on her family. He knew he was innocent, but because he cared more about his, his position, he was afraid that he might get in trouble with, uh, with uh, Caesar for not um, keeping these people under control and getting all the taxes that he could from them instead of having riots and killing people. You know, dead people don't pay much taxes. Um, so he's afraid for himself. He's supposed to be a man uh, administering justice. He knows this is injustice, but he, to advance his career or to save himself, he goes ahead against his better judgment and condemns the innocent. <clears throat> the whole time, um, Jesus is, is being very stoic about it. It's, now, if you think of the disciples, they were ready to fight with Jesus. And when the, the arresting party came, Peter jumps up and attacks someone, even cuts off his ear. Surprisingly, Jesus heals the man and he says, we're not fighting. Put your swords away. And they were going to follow Jesus to the death in their natural strength and courage. What they didn't understand that this was a spiritual battle. They were totally unprepared for that. And they didn't know what to do. They saw Jesus just surrender like a sheep to the slaughter. And they, they didn't know what to do. It was totally unexpected. And so they, they just ran away scared. Now think about it. He was crucified. The Romans crucified thousands of people. You've per perhaps heard of the movie Spartacus or heard about him. Uh, this was about 60 years before Christ. There was a rebellion of 6,000 slaves led by Spartacus. When the, the Roman legions finally caught them, they 
crucified all 6,000 at one time. Romans were famous for crucifying people, and they crucified many Jews. Even after the rebellion in 70 AD, they said um, they crucified so many Jews that they were running out of wood. And they were, the soldiers were getting bored, so they crucified them in different positions. And, uh, but crucifixion was a common thing. It was a way of terrifying people to be afraid of uh, fighting against the, the Roman government. So the centurion on duty had crucified many people. He knows how people act when they're crucified. He knows what they say. He knows what they do. And when Jesus got there, this man did not act like other men, and this man did not speak like other men. We have recorded in, this, in, the, in the Gospels seven words of Jesus on the cross. And this is the first time the centurion ever heard anybody speak like that, and the first time he ever saw anyone act like that. Father, forgive them. The people nailing his hands. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then... There was a th the, the, the two thieves on either side of him. It was supposed to be Barabbas in the middle and his two compatriots, because the word for thief can also mean insurrectionist. It means a criminal. Um, and so th probably these were th three insurrectionists together, and the leader was supposed to be in the middle. Barabbas I is set free. Uh, Pilate said, what do you want me to do? He knew that th it was for jealousy that the chief priest brought him there. And so he thought, the crowd will be with me because they love Jesus. He didn't know that it was the, the crowd that the chief priest had, had uh, it was a, a rent-a-mob that they had uh, brought together um, on purpose. And, uh, and so they said, crucify Christ, crucify your king, but today I always let someone go. So he's a criminal, I'll, I'll have him punished, I'll have him whipped, and I'll let him go. No, no, crucify him. But I should let someone go, I'll let him go. Let Barabbas go. You want me to let Barabbas go, an insurrectionist and a murderer, and, and you want to crucify your king? Yes. Uh, the blood, his blood will be on us. And so they, they, they had him crucified. But on the, on the cross, the, there's Jesus with the two thieves. At first, the thieves are making fun of him. But then the, the thief, like the centurion, he sees how Jesus acts. And he sees the things. And he realizes this man really is who they say he is. They hear the chief priest mocking him. If you're the Christ and you're doing miracles, do this miracle. Come down from the cross and they will believe in you. And they're making fun of him. Um, he saved others, but he, he can't save himself. Actually, the, the verb would be he won't save himself. He could, but he wouldn't because he came to save sinners. So the one thief looks at him and he says, he says, um, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. He believed that this man nailed to a cross really was the king of Israel, really was the one that the prophets talked about. And it wasn't Barabbas. It wasn't an insurrectionist come with uh, uh, swords. It was this man who presented himself as a, a sheep for the slaughter. Remember me when you come into the kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this day you will be with me in paradise. And so here's this, this uh, criminal, and he can actually see. Now, the other criminal, he just said, if you're the Christ, save yourself and save us. What's the difference between these two men? Let's think about the cross a minute. The cross, people are, are clever, and people have invented all different ways of, of killing people, and some have been extremely cruel. There's many different methods. People have been very inventive about, about that, torture and different things like that. But this method of killing someone, the person is lifted off the ground, and they're suspended in the sky. They're between earth and sky, between earth and heaven. It's a bridge between earth and heaven. That's very symbolic. And now there's a, a man on this side and a man on this side. They symbolize the world, because at the end of days, at, on the judgment, there's only going to be two groups of people. The ones who believe in Jesus and repented of their sins and say, I need a Savior. Remember me in your kingdom. And those who just want to be saved from the consequences of sin. They don't want to be saved from sin. They just want to be saved from death, saved from judgment. People, 
people like their sin. These people said they're sorry for their sin, and they've repented of it. And these people only want to be saved from death. And that's what the world is. This side will be blessed, and, will, and Jesus will, will save this group, and this side will die in their sins and go to the judgment and be cursed. And so it's, it's very representative. It's a very, an amazing picture. Later, the Apostle Paul tells us that to the one group, the cross sounds stupid. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. It sounds weak and foolish. But to this group, like the, the thief on the cross who somehow had eyes to see, it's not weak, it's not foolish, it's the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. And those who receive this, they find it's the power of God to save them. <clears throat> and that's, and that's uh, important. So even though it's been, it was prophesied through, through the ages, it's still hard for people to believe. On the day of the resurrection, I know this is a good Friday, but, and, and, but Sunday's coming, so we'll just talk about that as a little preview. But on the day of the resurrection, two disciples, not two of the apostles, but two of the other disciples had left Jerusalem before they heard about Jesus coming out of the grave. And they're very upset. They're very depressed. They're very dejected. And they're walking along, talking to each other. And, and a stranger comes up and starts walking with them. Obviously, he was also coming from Jerusalem. And he says, what are you guys talking about? What are we talking about? The whole city's talking about this. Well, what is it? What's the whole city talking about? There was this man, a prophet. He did miracles. We thought he was the Messiah. He's called Jesus of Nazareth. And we thought that he was uh, going to be the one who delivers Israel. Yeah? What happened to him? Oh, the chief priests, they, they delivered him over to Pilate and they killed him. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, not only that, but this is the third day and some of our women went to the tomb. They found it empty. Angels told them that he's risen. Really? And you're depressed? The women told you that he's risen? The angels told you? And you're depressed? Why are you depressed? They didn't understand that this was actually Jesus himself. And uh, their, eyes, their eyes couldn't recognize him. And he said, what's wrong with you guys? You're so foolish and slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Didn't, didn't Christ first have to suffer and then enter the paradise? Enter his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained the scriptures concerning himself. And, and, uh, and then he, uh, uh, they, they made it to their destination, and they, and they said, stay with us, stay with us, because Jesus acted like he was going to keep going. No, stay with us and eat with us. And so they stayed, he stayed with them and ate with them, and when he broke the bread, their eyes were open. And they go, oh, it's Jesus. And then uh, he disappears from them. And so they get up and they run back uh, to Jerusalem. And when they get there, um, the other men had already seen Christ and they were telling each other the stories of having seen Christ. And so we go back to John the Baptist's question. Are you the one who is to come or is there another? We're not expecting another person to come, but we're expecting another coming of the same person. We're expecting Jesus Christ to come a second time. And that's, and that's what it is. The first time, he doesn't come as the conquering king, punishing evil and sin and, and, and sinners. Why? If he did that, how many people would be in his kingdom? Because all of Adam's children are sinners. We're all sinners. If he punished sin the first time, we'd, he'd punish all of us. He came the first time as one to take away sin. He came uh, as a friend of sinners. And they said, why are you a friend of sinners? He said, the doctor goes to the sick. I've come to he bring uh, healing and relief to these people. He came to be the savior from, from sin. And so the ones who listened to John and repented, they believed Jesus. The ones who said, nah, I don't need to repent. Those people need it. I'm good enough in myself. I'll pass God's judgment on my own. I've done a lot of good things. I'm good enough. Those people will die in their sins and they'll, be, they'll uh, lose in the judgment. Jesus is coming back. The time between his first coming and his second coming is, call, is the day of grace. It's the day of invitation. It's, it's the day for people to repent and trust their Christ. 
He's given the church the job to go into all the world, tell the story about Jesus. This is good news. Tell the, and it's not good advice. It's good news. It's what Jesus has done on the cross. Tell them the story and give people the opportunity to believe. They can join the camp that repents, confesses their sin, and believes in Christ, or they can stay in the camp that says, um, I'm doing fine. God's happy with me. But tell the people this. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, and, and I'm with you always until the end of the age. And so the church is to be telling the story until Jesus comes back. And so the, this is a day of opportunity for people to repent and believe in what Christ has done on the cross. And th there's an end to that. When Christ comes back, the invitation's over. It's like you can buy tickets to get on the plane, but when the plane takes off, it's too late. But these tickets aren't for sale. Jesus already paid for these tickets. And you can get it, but you have to get it before the plane takes off. And there's two ways the plane takes off. One, Jesus comes back. Or two, uh, he, Jesus comes back to earth or you leave this earth in death. And so you have to receive Christ before that happens. And that's why it's called the day of salvation. So Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them because the sins were nailed to the tree, nailed to the cross. This is a time, this is an opportunity for people to repent and believe. And so that's our message. Um, the reason that Christ was so unexpected is they wanted a conquering king. That will happen the second time Christ comes back. The first time he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. The second time he'll ride in on a war horse with a sword in his hand. He'll save his people, and he'll punish his enemies. And so you want to receive the suffering Jesus before he comes back as the conquering king. And then you'll be on the right side of, of history and eternity. God was, will not count the sins of those who've trusted in Christ because those sins were covered by the blood of Christ on the tree. Now, um, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, and we invite you to come to our church. We're having a sunrise service. You could say a sunrise, sunrise service, because at sunrise, we're going to celebrate the fact that the sun rose, Jesus Christ, and we're going to have breakfast, and you can also, or you can come to the 930 uh, worship service, and that's right, right there in Dearborn, the corner of Outer Drive and, uh, and uh, Gulf View, and we'd like to have you come, um, and that would be our invitation. Thank you. Have a blessed day, a blessed Holy Week, and a blessed Easter. Amen.